الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنة يوم الدين I will praise due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day We are continuing with the tafsir of Surah Al-Kahf the 18th chapter of the Quran In our previous session we looked at verses 9 and 10 where Allah compared the strangeness of the story of the people of the cave with the creation itself. That though the story of the people of the cave might appear to us to be something very weird, very strange, amazing, the creation of Allah is far greater. And in verse 10, he began to introduce the story of the people of the cave in, uh, in a simplified fashion, where he said that those people, young people, and it's mentioned as young people, and we discussed the significance of them being young, that they had called on Allah after making their effort to find a place of refuge, they called on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah answered their prayer. That we took from that verse the importance of making effort and depending on Allah. Not just depending on Allah without making any effort on our own parts. Or making efforts on our own parts and not depending on Allah. Thinking that we can do it, you know, we are responsible for our own destinies, that in fact you know, uh, everything depends on us. And um, we also uh, pointed out with regards to the young people fleeing that the issue of hijra, where people are obliged to flee circumstances wherein they're not able to practice the religion. This is a standard principle which existed from the time of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam and all of the Prophets before. But particularly in the life of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, we see the most clear examples of the Hijra. The Hijra first to Abyssinia, to Ethiopia of his companions and then for himself and his companions to Medina. And that this principle of Hijra is an ongoing principle until the last day. As the Prophet ﷺ had said, لا تنقطع الهجرة حتى تنقطع التوبة That hijra will not end until repentance ends. That is, repentance will no longer be accepted. When he went on to say, وَلَا تنقطع التوبة حتى, ينقطع, حتى يطلع الشمس من مغربها Until the sun rises from its place of setting. When the sun rises from the west, then Toba will no longer be accepted. So until that point comes, Hijra remains a principle among us until the last day. And he, Prophet Muhammad ﷺ had also said, أَنَا بَرِيءٌ مِمَّا نَعَاشَ بَيْنَ ظَهْرَنِي الْكُفَارِ I am free, innocent, of anyone who lives amongst the disbelievers. So from that principle we took that the, the popular practice now of making hijra to western countries uh, for the sake of economics we want a good life for ourselves and our children so we leave our muslim lands and we go to <coughs> the lands of the disbelievers that this is in something something in fact which is contrary to the sharia the scholars held this to be haram unless there is some uh, justifying principle of necessity whether it be for medical causes or for education which cannot be gotten any, any, anywhere else not necessarily at that standard but cannot be gotten period anywhere else etc so uh, you will find actually when many uh, people f who are in the west etc when they speak to the scholars the leading scholars of the east uh, talking about their situations in the west you will hear them commonly asking the people, so when do you plan to make hijrah? You know, when people make all their complaints about what's happening in, 
in the West to their children, their families, and all these different problems that exist, then that was the, that's their response. So when are you planning to make hijra? So after looking at that, we now go on to verse number 11. And we had looked at some other points within that, uh, the issue of the hijra in point in verse 10, which had to do with the raising of children fearing Allah and its significance and of course being in the West being in a non-Muslim non-Islamic environment the possibilities of that are reduced considerably over doing so in a Muslim environment in verse 11 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say فَضَرَبْنَا عَلَىٰ آذَانِهِمْ فِي الْكَهْفِ سِنِينَ عَدَدَىٰ then I drew a veil over their ears for a number of years. Imam al-Shawkani, the Yemeni scholar, Hadith scholar, scholar of tafsir. His tafsir is called Fatwal Qadir. He was actually originally from the Imami uh, Shiites of Yemen. Uh, the, the group they call the Zaydiyya. But he, in gaining his knowledge of the Sunnah in general, left that and came to be one of the leading scholars of his era from Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Anyway, he said in his tafsir, This means I shut their ears with sleep, which prevented them from hearing sounds. Drawing a veil over their ears is a metaphor for deep sleep, which, present, which prevents sounds from reaching the ears. According to Al-Qurtubi, Al-Qurtubi, he is another leading scholar of tafsir from Spain. Uh, his origin is Arab origin, but he was a leading scholar in Spain. His uh, tafsir is known as Tafsir Al-Qurtubi in common terms, but uh, his, the actual name is Al-Jami' li Ahkam Al-Qur'an. Anyway, in his tafsir, he said, the ears were used in the metaphor because it is through them that the corruption of oversleeping takes place and it is through them that sleep is halted. The Prophet ﷺ also used the ear metaphor to describe the sleeping state saying, Bala shaytanu fi udhuni. Satan urinated in his ear. Actually this is from a hadith in which uh, it is found in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari where some companions uh, came to the Prophet ﷺ and told them about an individual who used to sleep until sunrise, you know, and uh, uh, then he would get up and pray. So the Prophet ﷺ said, "Ash-shaytanu bala fi udhuni." Satan urinated in his ear, uh, you know, indicating that he had been overcome by the sleep. And of course, this is a circumstance which happens to all of us at some time and the Prophet ﷺ had said well if you oversleep you pray whenever you wake up whenever you are conscious but and we're not held really accountable for it the Prophet ﷺ had said that uh, the pen is lifted from three individuals among them is the sleeper until he awakes but that is in a case where a person has done what is necessary to get up we have alarm clocks now we set an alarm clock we go to sleep at a reasonable time. So there's a possibility of getting up. But if we stay up all night and then go to sleep, we don't even set the alarm clock and we say, well, I slept until after sunrise. See, this person, though on a, in a, on a technicality, according to the letter of the law, he's excused. But according to the spirit of the law, we will say, really, he intended not to get up. By his actions. Though he didn't say that, right? By his actions, his actions indicates his intent for not really getting up. So, uh, such a case would not really be excused and Allah knows best. The length of time they remained in the cave is mentioned as a number of years. Sinina adada. In this verse. However, the actual number was specified in verse 25 in both the lunar and solar calendars, calculations. So they stayed in the cave for 300 years and nine more. It's mentioned in verse 25. And the scholars analyzing that were saying that it's 300 years according to the solar calendar and 309 
according to the lunar calendar. In verse 12, Allah goes on to say, ثُمَّ بَعَثْنَاهُمْ لِنَعْلَمَ أَيُّ الْحِزْبَيْنِ أَحْصَى لِمَا لَبِثُوا أَمَدًا Then I aroused them in order to test which of the two parties was best in calculating the length of time that they had passed. Al-Uthaymeen said, then we resurrected them. Actually the verbs there in, in the Arabic is ba'athnahum. Ba'athna is usually understood to mean resurrected. So he explained that this term resurrected is used uh, when waking them from sleep because of the fact that sleep is a form of death. Sleep is a form of death. And in some narrations, Prophet ﷺ had said, sleep is the sister of death. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had said, هُوَ الَّذِي يَتَوَفَّاكُمْ بِاللَّيْلِ وَيَعْلَمُ مَا جَرَحْتُمْ بِالنَّهَارِ ثُمَّ يَبْعَثُكُمْ فِيهِ لِيُقْضَى أَجَلٌ مُسَمَّى ثُمَّ إِلَيْهِ مَرْجِعُكُمْ ثُمَّ يُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ it is he who takes your souls by night and has, a, has knowledge of all that you have done by the day. Then he raises you up again that the term appointed be fulfilled. Then unto him will be your return. Then he will inform you of what you used to do. This is Surah Al-An'am, verse 60. And also we find in Surah Zumar, verse 42, Allah يتوفى الأنفس حين موتها والتي لم تمت في منامها فيمسك التي قضى عليها الموت ويرسل الأخرى إلى أجل مسمى إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم يتفكرون It is Allah who takes away the souls at the time of their death and those that die not in their sleep. He keeps those for which he has ordained death and sends the rest for a term appointed. Indeed, in this are signs for the people who think deeply. That's Surah Zumar, verse 42. So, I'll, uh, so the, the point here is that Allah uses the term ba'athna because of its similarity. The resurrection from the dead is similar to being awake, awoken from sleep. So he uses that term. So in translation of the verse, we say, then I rouse them in order to test them. Right? I rouse them. I woke them up. al then said, there could be a problem in Al the Almighty's statement, then we resurrected them in order to know. لِيَعْلَمْ لِنَعْلَمْ It is whether Allah, most great and glorious, did not know before that or not. See, there is an implication in the verse when it said there, and I roused them in order to test them. Actually, I translated it to test them. But the literal uh, translation is, then we resurrected them or we aroused them in order to know. Implying that Allah didn't know before He aroused them. That is the implication of the verse. All right, so al uthaymin clarified that this phrase, in order to know, has two meanings. One, knowledge of sight and appearance and witnessing. That is, it meant in order to see. It is well known that knowledge of what will be is not the same as knowledge of what was. Allah's knowledge of something before its occurrence is knowledge that it will occur. But after its occurrence, it is knowledge that it occurred. It's maybe a little philosophical here. <laughs> okay. But, I mean, you're dealing with a touchy point, really. You know, and this, this happens in a number of places in the Quran where we hear Allah talking about testing in order to know. You know, which, and of course, anybody who is thinking, well, Allah knows all things, so why would He be testing in order to know? So, so how do we put this in some category that we can understand it without affecting or committing shirk in Allah's names and attributes. Because if we imply or we say that Allah didn't know, that implies a form of shirk in His names and attributes. Because if Allah is Al-Alim, He's the All-Knowing, nothing is hidden from Him, then to say He learned something after not knowing it is implying 
that he didn't know everything. Right? So, to, in order to explain this, this point uh, Sheikh al Uthaymin is, is bringing out here, is that Allah knows what is going to occur. There is no doubt. He knows what is going to occur. <coughs> However, the knowledge of what is going to occur is not the knowledge, is not the same as the knowledge after it has occurred. It's not the same as the knowledge after it has occurred. Even for ourselves, think about it. Allah told us, Yawm al-Qiyamah is going to happen. Prophet ﷺ told us, Dajjal is coming. This is knowledge of something which is going to occur, which is all certainty. But is it the same as being in the time when Dajjal shows up, and he shows up? Or on the day of judgment when we actually raise, are raised up from our graves? It's not the same. Right? For us, there is... The two of them are not equal. For us, the two of them are not equal. For Allah, they're equal, but they're not the same. They're equal, but not the same. Equal in the sense that knowing for Allah, to know what occurs and what will occur, is all the same to Him. Right? But, in, in terms of the actual thing itself, it is not the same. Relative to Allah, it is the same, but the occurrence of the thing is not the same. Well, he goes on to explain that his knowledge of the occurrence of that thing does not, in and of itself, have attached to it a punishment or reward. Whereas, the occurrence of the particular incident will have the attachment of reward or punishment. Allah knows you're going to do something. But He is not punishing us because He knew we were going to do it. He punishes us because we did it. You understand? But relative to Allah, it's the same. He could have punished us without us actually doing it. And He would be justified because He knew we were going to do it and we are going to do it. But the system that he has put in place in order to express the completeness of his justice, he has said this himself, that he would only punish us when we actually do it. Okay? So when Allah then speaks of in order to know, as he said, for example, in Surah Muhammad verse 31, that is 40, chapter 47 verse 31, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ حَتَّى نَعْلَمَ الْمُجَاهِدِينَ مِنْكُمْ وَالصَّابِرِينَ And I will test you until I know those who strive, those who are the mujahideen, among you and those who are patient. So the test here is not again for Allah to know who really is the mujahid. He knows who is the mujahid. But in the course of the test it brings out. So it is a, it's a knowledge of making some, something appear, making something a reality. On, on the basis of which there will be reward and punishment. Okay? He goes on to say, As to the certainty about the occurrence of what is known relative to Allah, there is no difference between what he knows will occur and what he knows has occurred. Right? Again, as to the certainty of occurrence, as to the certainty of occurrence of what is known relative to Allah, as to the certainty of its occurrence, there is no difference between what he knows will occur and what he knows has occurred. There is a difference between knowing what will occur and what has occurred. There is a difference between the two. But in, relative to the certainty of their occurrence, there is no difference relative to the Allah. Relative to ourselves, there is a big difference. Relative to ourselves, there is a big difference. We hear from the Prophet ﷺ, we hear from Allah ﷻ, we believe, but 
it is not like being there at the time to witness it. And in fact, there's a famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in which, you know, he had stressed the same point that uh, he said, لَيْسَ الْخَبَرُ كَالْمُعَايَنَةِ لَيْسَ الْخَبَرُ كَالْمُعَايَنَةِ That information is not like witnessing. Information about something is not like witnessing its occurrence. Actually, that came in a hadith in which um, uh, the Prophet ﷺ went on to say that Allah, most great and glorious, informed Moses about what his people did with the calf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed Moses about what his people did with the calf, making the calf and worshipping it. But he didn't throw the tablets down. The tablets, the Torah that he received with the he had gone Mount Sinai, received the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala written down. When Allah informed him that his people in his absence had worshipped the calf, he didn't throw the tablets down. But when he went back and he saw them worshipping the calf, he was so upset, he threw the tablets down. So the Prophet ﷺ said, information is not like witnessing. Allah's statement, which of the two parties is best in calculating the length of time that they passed? That they differed concerning the time they had spent. Some said we stayed for a day or part of a day in verse 19, while others said your Lord knows best how long you spent. Then people after their time further differed how long they had spent. Ashanqiti said, that is uh, Sheikh Al Amin Ashanqiti, who was one of the leading scholars in Medina University, originally from Mauritania. He wrote a classical tafsir of the Quran known as Adwa Al Bayan. And that is uh, a tafsir in which he focused on the tafsir of the Quran by the Quran. He brought other evidences too, but the core of his tafsir was tafsir of Quran by Quran. We talked about the methods of tafsir earlier in our tafsir classes. Huh? <clears throat> anyway, he said, the most great and transcendent mentioned in this verse that among the reasons for his resurrection of the people of the cave after that long sleep was to clarify for people which of the two groups uh, were correct with regards to the length of time they had spent. But he did not explain anything about the two groups. Most tafsir scholars hold that one of these groups was the people of the cave and the other the people of the city in which the youths were res resuscitated as they were aware of the date of the incident of the youths. Others held that the two groups were both from the previously mentioned city as there were among them believers and some disbelievers. Yet others held other opinions. Ibn Abbas had said that the kings who ruled the city was the first group and the people of the cave constituted the second group. However, as Shankita goes on to say, what the Quran indicates is that both groups were from the people of the cave and the Quran best explains itself. That is in Allah's statement and in that way I raised them up again, this is verse 19, so that they would question each other. One of them asked, how long have you spent there? The others answered, we have spent a day or part of a day. And they declared, your Lord knows best how long you have spent. It is as though those who said, your Lord knows best how long you have spent, were the ones who realized they had spent a long time. As Shankita goes on to say, I have explained in this blessed book that among the different types of explanations contained in it is that Allah, most glorious and transcendent, mentions the wisdom behind something in one place and there be for that thing other points of wisdom mentioned in other places. Having understood that, you should realize that the Almighty has explained this verse 
explained in this verse that the reason for rousing them was to expose to the people which of the two groups most accurately calculated their time. He explained elsewhere other reasons, and in that way I raised them up so that they would question each other. And among them, it was to inform people that the res res resurrection was real, and the final hour was true due to the implications of the story of the people of the cave. In this way I caused them to be found, in verse 21. I caused them to be found so that they would know that Allah's promise is true, and the hour of resurrection is coming without a doubt. So the point that he's making here, as Shankit is making, that Allah, this is some, a phenomenon that you will find in the Qur'an, where Allah will give the reason for something in one place, and give another reason for that thing in another place, for the same thing. Right? Meaning that the, the reasons are multiplied. It's not just one reason. There are a variety of reasons. So in, in one element or one presentation of the story, he focused on one me meaning. And another presentation, he focuses on a, another reason and another principle. Right? Now, what, what is important about this? Is that if you're not aware of this, then if you go to answeringislam.com, hmm, you go to answeringislam.com on the internet, right? www.answeringislam.com, where the uh, person who established the site is attacking Islam, focusing on the Quran itself, after quoting the verse wherein Allah said that if this was from other than Allah, you would find in it many contradictions. He goes on to say, well, here's a hundred contradictions. And among them, he brings examples where Allah said, the reason for this is this, in one place. And he said, the reason for this same thing is this, in another place. So he said, well, which reason is it? <laughs> he, he, does, he, he, he can't fathom that it could be for more than one reason. So one reason is mentioned in one place, and another reason is mentioned in another place. Right? It's not just black and white, it's either either or or. No, it can be both. It's an important principle because if you're not aware of it and somebody throws this on you, you know, here's contradictions in your book, then of course, what do you say? You're stumped. Ashanqiti goes on to say, you should know that the statement of the most glorious and transcendent, transcendent in, in this noble verse, and we resurrected them in order to know, does not indicate that he did not know that before their res res resuscitation, and that he only knew that after their resuscitation, as claimed by some disbelievers and atheists. Instead, he most transcendent and glorious knows what will be before it is, and nothing is hidden from him. The verses which indicate that are innumerable, among the most clearly worded verses which show that he, that he does not gain new knowledge from tests and trials, may be exalted from that, is his statement, وَلِيَبْتَلِيَ اللَّهُ مَا فِي صُدُورِكُمْ وَلِيُمَحِّصَ مَا فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ بِذَاتِ الصُّدُورِ But that Allah might test what is in your chests, and to purify what is in your hearts, and Allah is the all-knower of what is in your chests. That's Ali Imran verse 154. His statement, and Allah is the all knower of what, of what is in your chest, after his statement, but that Allah might test, is obvious proof of that. If that is clear, then the meaning of then we resurrected them in order to know, is to know knowledge which would expose the reality to people. And that does not contradict his knowing it before its occurrence, while none of his creatures did. Important point. Because... As I mentioned earlier, some of you weren't present. We do have <coughs> among the leading figures, uh, knowledgeable individuals uh, of the past, recent past, like Muhammad Iqbal in his book, The Reconstruction of Islamic Thought. He does make the statement that Allah does not know the details of the future. He knows the general future, but he did not know the details of the future. And in recent times, we have another individual, Shabir Ali, from Guyana, who is one of the leading 
uh, dua in uh, in Canada now, you know, carrying on the tradition of uh, Ahmed Didat debating with Christians and so on. So, Alhamdulillah, he's done a wonderful job. In fact, uh, we have some of his uh, lectures which we distribute. We use it in our Dawa course. Very good. But he has fallen into the same trap, and he has made this statement openly. You know, and I personally advise him not to. You know, if you have a doubt, you got a problem, keep it to yourself. You know, discuss it with knowledgeable people. Don't get up on the member and tell people about it. Because then you, you're putting yourself in serious problems, you know. You know, so unfortunately, I mean, he went on the member with it, you know. And uh, there are some scholars in Toronto who have declared him to be a disbeliever and that prayer behind him is invalidated. You know, because it's a serious statement. And it's a product of trying to deal with qadr. You know, not knowing where to stop. We believe Allah knows all things, and we believe that we have a choice in doing what we do. We function as far as that goes. When you try to go in to explain how it is that Allah knows what you're going to do, and you still have a choice, you run into problems. Because from our perception, it seems contradictory. If he knows what you're going to do, then you have no choice. It means you got to do it. Isn't it? Right? So to try to put choice in there and try to stick it together becomes problematic. I mean, we as believers, what we are required to do is just accept it. That Allah knows all things, without a doubt, with certainty. So, however that comes together, it comes together. We can look at, you know, examples that can help us get an idea. You know, the common example I, I give is that of the school teacher who has been teaching a student for 12 years of school. That when he reaches grade 12, when the classes come, the students join the class, the beginning of the term, he takes out his register, he writes down their names, and he writes the grades they're going to get. Then they go through the year. They do their tests, they do their exams, they do their homework, all the different things, classwork, everything. And he makes the calculation. And at the end, it works out to be exactly what he put there. Did he force them to get those marks? No. They still made their choices and got those marks. But he had knowledge of them, and this is limited. Of course, it's not like Allah's knowledge. Because it's still guesswork, in a sense. Though he has very deep knowledge in the sense he's taught them for 12 years, he knows his students in and out. But it's still a guess. Because it's not perfect. Whereas in the case of Allah, that knowledge is perfect. So if that helps us to understand, yeah, that could be, fine. If you can't understand it from that, then best thing is just leave it. Don't go in and, you know, try to turn your brain this way and that way, try to do it because it will pop. Our brains are not capable of grasping this. And if you are not able to grasp it, you have two ways to go. Either you submit or you try to find an explanation. And that's what happened to those who went that route. So they say, Allah knows the broad plans of the future, meaning... If you make this choice, what the consequence is going to be? If you make that choice, what the consequence is going to be? So the consequences of all of your choices, he knows. So in that sense, he knows the future. He knows everything in that sense. However, the actual choice you're going to make, he doesn't know. You see? This is how they resolved it. But the problem of that resolution is that you're saying, Allah doesn't know our choices until we make them. And that is serious. Serious error. So this point is, you know, although we've passed it in a very simple way, it is actually a very deep and serious point. We, it's important for us to grasp, you know, for ourselves, for our children, you know, and uh, for those around us who may fall prey to this idea. It's satanic actually, very dangerous. <clears throat> Uh, Shantiti goes on to say, 
If it is asked, what is the important benefit of the people knowing which of the two groups was most accurate in calculating the time spent and the reason for Allah Almighty's statement, then we resurrected them in order to know. What is important is for them, um, uh, uh, sorry, and what is important, and what is the important benefit from their asking each other so as to be the reason for this statement? And in that way, I raised them up again so that they would question each other. The answer is, <clears throat> and I have not seen anyone who has dealt with this, is that it appears to me, and Allah Almighty knows best, that what was mentioned of informing people about the most accurate group in calculating the period spent, and they're asking each other about it, necessitated the exposure for people, the reality of these youths. And that Allah had put them to sleep for 309 years, then res resuscitated them alive and with bodies fresh and unchanged. And this is among the amazing acts of the most glorious and the transcendent indicating the perfection of his ability to resurrect people after their death. And due to this necessity, he made what I mentioned uh, a reason and purpose, and Allah knows best. So, I mean, what he's pointing out here is that um, the reasoning that he gave, which Allah gave, concerning why he resurrected those youths, Right? He gave it in terms of that they would ask each other, that it would become clear which one made the correct uh, calculation. But one may say, what is the benefit of that? So what if they asked each other or not? Or so what if they, one was correct in the calculation or not? So he goes on to explain that the goal of that all was that their story would be exposed to the people around them. Had he just saved them by putting them in the cave and, you know, saving them until Yom Qiyamah, then the people of the city in times to come would not have benefited from it. So that resurrection which involved, or resuscitation which involved them asking each other and trying to figure out the times and everything else, this brought out the amazing uh, issues of their story, and it had then an impact on the people of their time. In summary, looking at this uh, verse, Allah protected the youth and revived them as a test for people, and a test for the youth themselves, because they were unaware of how long they had slept. The message of the verse is being that Allah answered their prayers by keeping people away from them, while they slept in the cave, and by causing them to miraculously survive all those years. Allah is the one who can do the unexpected. We have to believe that even though situations may seem hopeless, Allah can always solve the problem. It is a reminder to us of crises in our own lives which seem to be hopeless, but, when, but with Allah's help we were able to come through. This story is in its own way, in its own way expresses that same concept. If we put our trust in Allah, He will find a way for us. As He said, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ وَمَن يَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ فَهُوَ حَسْبُ Whoever fears Allah, He will make for him a way out and provide for him from where he did not expect it. And whoever trusts in Allah, he will be sufficient for him. Verse 13. نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ نَبَأَهُمْ بِالْحَقِّ إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَزِدْنَاهُمْ هُدَىٰ I will relate their true story to you. They were youths who believed in their Lord, and I increased their level of guidance. From verse 13 onwards, Allah then goes into the details of the story. He goes back to the beginning again, and He now gives the details. Prior to that, He gave a summary, and now He's giving the detail. 
The actual text says, we will relate their true story to you. al said, concerning the use of we, in relation to Allah, that he is one with no doubt. But there is also no doubt that he is the greatest of all who are great. And according to Arabic idiom, whenever a single person refers to himself using a plural form, it indicates that he is great. It is known that there is nothing greater than Allah. Thus the intent of every plural pronoun referring to Allah Almighty is praise. Is important. It's also used in English by rulers like the Queen of England when she issues her edicts, what she's going to do. She always says, we will do this and we will do that. But she's talking about herself. We also find it in legal documents which are being presented to courts, etc. They use this we when referring to individuals. And in, um, in English they call it the royal we or the majestic we. Again an important point because you will find among the missionaries in order to cre create doubts in the minds of Muslims. They say here, look, Allah is referring to himself as we. You know? So the idea of the Trinity, the Father, God the Father, God the Son and the Holy Spirit is there in your Quran. A plural. You said he is one but he calls himself we. You know? So again, if you don't understand Arabic language, and you will find it also in the Bible, in Hebrew. Same thing, because Hebrew being a sister language of Arabic, use the same expression. So, very important, because as I said, this is one of the ways that people are deceived by Orientalist uh, trickery. Al-Qurtubi said that Allah's almighty statement, I will relate their true story to you, was due to the implications of disagreements around the length of their stay in the cave, that, which was found in Allah's previous statement, then I roused them in order to test which of the two parties was best in calculating. So he followed it with information that he, most great and glorious, knows the truth of what took place regarding them. Christian and Western historians, in general, refer to this story, the story of the sleepers, seven sleepers of Ephesus, as a legend. They will talk about the legend of the seven sleepers. Though the Roman Catholic and the Orthodox churches, they believe it to be a miraculous story. And in fact, they even give the names of the seven sleepers. Their names differ between the Eastern Orthodox and the uh, Roman Catholic. And some of these names you will find also in some of our tafsirs, where they have got these narrations and included it. But of course, in essence, we really don't know the truth of this matter. But anyway, the point is that according to the existing historical we meth uh, record, the story about the seven sleepers had been circulating for many years. And it was not until the 6th century that a Syriac historian recorded it, put it in writing. And he is the one who identified their number as seven and told about the circumstances under which they ended up in the cave and that it took place during the reign of the emperor uh, Decius, right? So, uh, of course, this was before the time of Muslims. So, you know, we know that this is not from us. We're not the one who planted the story. We believe in the truth of it from what Allah has said. But this is why Allah points out that He is going to give us the true story. Because there were rumors, legends around in the world concerning it. And He would give, of course, as is His way, to give the truth about the matter. And you find actually this expression mentioned in a number of places in the Quran where Allah talks about telling stories in truth, true stories. And He... You know, normally we use fiction to get across certain ideas, you know, even from a, uh, you could say from a sociological point. People, you know, um, Dickens when he wrote uh, David Copperfield, he was writing a story trying to get across a problem which existed in that time of oppression of children and these kind of things. So he told that story and it was a very effective story. You know, it had an impact, actually changed 
you know, some of the social institutions of that time. But from the perspective of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything He has told us is the truth. It's not necessary to go into fictitious stories in order to get points across. And the same thing with the stories of the Prophet You know, he is related to us. When you read the hadith, he's related to different stories about people of the past. And sometimes it might come in our head that this might be just a story. But no. Be clear that it's the truth. It's the whole truth. Because there is no necessity to bring across a concept for a story to be invented. When Allah knows everything, and whatever the Prophet ﷺ told us of the stories of the people of the past, this is what Allah revealed to him because he didn't know these things. He didn't have the ability to know it. So it's the truth. They were youths who believed in their Lord and I increased their level of guidance. This statement, there were youths who believed in their Lord, implied that if they were in fact Christians, and this is something we're not absolutely certain of. Right? Because the Quranic story doesn't say they were Christians. But we're just linking it to the, the historical evidence that it appears that they were. That if they were Christians in fact, they were not Trinitarians. If they were Christians, they were not Trinitarians, which is the majority of Christianity now. So because back in that time, in the third century, because Decius was from the 3rd century. In that time, there was a struggle going on between Eastern Christians who were Unitarians and Western Christians who were Trinitarians. It was going on during that time. Between Eastern Christians who considered Jesus to be a creation of Allah. A prophet and a creation of Allah. Whereas Western Christians in Greece and Rome believed that Jesus was Allah, incarnate, God incarnate. Third of three, and he was himself, God incarnate. So there was a struggle going on. And in fact, uh, a fact which is little known to the vast majority of Christians, even many who consider themselves to be knowledgeable Christians, could be nuns and, and priests and others who have studied, there, many of them are unaware of the fact <clears throat> that for the 70 years after the time of Jesus, or really I shouldn't say 70 years, say 30 years, if Jesus was supposed to have died 40 years after his, uh, in their teachings, right? Lifted up in our beliefs, his departure 40 years after the, the, the uh, beginning of the Christian era, right? After he departed, he left someone in charge of his disciples. This is in church records. They have detailed records about an individual who was left there in charge of the church, of what was called the Jerusalem church. His name was James. And in fact, there is more written information about him in church records even than Jesus. And the only other figure from that early generation where there is more written record about is Paul. After Paul comes James. But he has been obscured. You don't hear him talked about or he's, you know, until recently, in the last five years, six years, a number of church historians have dug up the material about James and they have written some classics on James which show James as the head of the Jerusalem church being a Unitarian meaning that they're believing that there was only one God and that Jesus was a messenger of God the Messiah Messiah and that they continued to practice the same traditions which had been inherited from Moses, praying by washing themselves first, prostrating, all the different things. He continued that tradition until he was assassinated 30 years after Jesus' departure. And after his assassination, there was a rebellion of the Jews in Jerusalem. The Romans destroyed the temple of Solomon and chased all the Jews out of Jerusalem. 
And of course, when he, they chased out the Jews, the Jewish Christians, you can call them Judeo-Christians, those who outwardly they appeared like the other Jews, they were chased out also. But they were those who were the true followers of Jesus. They were all chased out. So the Jerusalem church as the center for Christianity, if Christianity means those following the teachings of Christ, that center was destroyed. And it was at this point that Paul took over. Paul was in Antioch. And in the records, in the New Testament, you read of James calling Paul to back to Jerusalem and speaking strongly with him about the changes that he was making. There was a struggle going on there. Paul would come to Jerusalem, sit with James and say, okay, okay, when he goes back, he does his own thing. Changing the religion, you know, uh, really paganizing it. So when that center was destroyed, Paul now had the only other center in Antioch, which is southern Turkey. And he now took over leadership of this Christian movement. And that's where it went. And you find these writers who are now writing that if that James had not been uh, assassinated and the church uh, destroyed there in Jerusalem, Christianity may have gone another route altogether. And then, you know, they talked about this tradition of Unitarianism. And in one of the books it said, actually the tradition of James is alive in Islam. You know, it's quite obvious. So the point is that these youths, if they were Christians, we would have to say that they were coming from the tradition of James. The Unitarians, not the Trinitarians. Ashankiti, he said concerning the verse, what is understood from this noble verse is that whoever believes in his Lord and obeys him, his Lord will increase his state of guidance because obedience is a cause for the increase of guidance and faith. This understanding from this noble verse appears clearly in other places in the Quran. For example, in Allah Almighty's statement, وَالَّذِينَ اهْتَدَوْ زَادَهُمْ هُدَى وَآتَاهُمْ تَقْوَاهُمْ As for those who accepted guidance, he increases their guidance and bestows on them their piety. At Surah Muhammad, verse 17. And also in Surah Tawbah, verse 124. فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فَزَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَهُمْ يَسْتَبْشِرُونَ As for those who believe, it increased their faith and they rejoice. These verses mentioned are clear, unambiguous texts proving that faith increases. And what is understood from them, that it also decreases. As Imam al-Bukhari used these verses and others similar to them to prove in his Sahih al-Bukhari. Thus there is no place for disagreement with their existence as you can clearly see. What he's referring to here is the concept of Iman, faith increasing and decreasing. This is clear from the verse. The verse concerning the youth, other verses, and there are a number of others in the Quran. Why, why talk about this? Why even mention this point? Why? Because there was a belief which developed among some Muslim scholars, Abu Hanifa being among them, and those from the Hanafi school in that area, in Iraq, etc., that faith did not increase or decrease. You either have faith or you don't have it. Right? This was an opinion that they held. Of course, the opinion that they held had with it modifications that actions, though not an essential principle of faith, are linked, is linked to faith. And that if you have the correct faith, it will produce the actions. Right? But they don't make it a condition for the faith. Right? So uh, that, is, that concept was there with them. You had another group beyond them who came to be known as the Murji'a, who held the position that uh, not only does faith not increase or decrease, but actions don't, doesn't affect faith at all. Right? And this represented a major deviation you know, in Islamic theology of the past. 
Now that position basically was overcome in time. The vast majority of scholarship rejected it. But it filtered down amongst the masses of people. Amongst the masses of the people, it has filtered down. If you listen to the Christians, that's what they're saying. They will ask you, do you know where you're going when you die? Heaven or hell? And of course you as a Muslim has to say, no, I don't know. And Allah knows best. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. As we're saying, the idea that Iman does not increase or decrease, that once you believe, you have believed, it's either you believe or you don't believe, is common amongst the Christians who hold that once you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then it doesn't matter what you do. Evil deeds, etc. is not going to affect that. You're going to paradise, finish. You're guaranteed. Right? That's their belief. A believing Muslim, if asked, do you know where you're going? is supposed to say, I don't know. Right? Allah knows best. I would like to go to paradise, but I don't know what state I will be in at the time of my death. Nobody knows what state he or she is going to be in. But if you listen to the statements of the mass of Muslims today, you will hear in it that same thought. Because I'm a Muslim, I'm guaranteed paradise. Because my parents were Muslims, my name is a Muslim name, then for sure I'm going to paradise. Allah Ghafoor Rahim. You know, Allah is the most merciful. You know, He is forgiving. Doesn't really matter what you do. You know, He's, that he's going to forgive you. Don't worry about it. So, this thought has become common amongst the masses of Muslims. And they like to quote, of course, the hadith of Prophet ﷺ when he said, Kullu ummati yadkhulun al jannah. All of my nation will enter paradise. They stop there. Of course, the Prophet ﷺ didn't stop there. He went, went on to say, Illa man aba, except for those who refuse. And the companions asked, Who would refuse, O Messenger of Allah? He said, مَنْ أَطَاعَنِي دَخْلَ الْجَنَّةِ وَمَنْ أَصَاعَنِي فَقَدْ أَبَى Whoever obeys me will enter paradise. And whoever disobeys me has refused. He has refused by his disobedience. So that second part of the hadith that I said is ignored. People just focus on the whole ummah is going to paradise. You know? A mistaken concept. And this is a sickness which exists amongst the ummah today. Um, Allah's tests of people according to their belief is to increase their faith. We talked about that earlier. That the tests have a purpose. The fundamental purpose of Allah testing, our, uh, testing us is to increase our faith. If we are patient, then it gets us through the calamities and our faith increases. And patience comes ultimately from, where does patience come from? What do you have to have to have patience? Huh? Yeah, belief, I mean belief is very general, but specifically, there's an element of belief, trusting in Allah. That element of belief has to be there. Because you can say, I believe in Allah, but do you trust in Him practically in your life? No. If you don't trust in him really, then you can't have patience. You will not have the patience to deal with the trials. So trust is an element of belief which is the foundation for patience. Allah says he doesn't burden any soul beyond his capacity. We believe him. That's the iman. And because of that iman, we trust in him. And because of that trust, then we can be patient to deal with the trials. So the trials come based on the faith the trust it produces, the patience which is its product, and the person's faith increases with each and every trial. Also, Allah informs us that He can increase our faith as a way of telling us that we should not become complacent. 
not to think that we are good believers. You know, khalas. We are good. We look at those below us. Of course, is what we do. You know, we look at people around us. Yeah, oh, these people are going to hell. You know, they're doing all these bad things. I'm, at least I'm not doing those things. Then when you look, at, look in that way, you become complacent. Whereas what we should be looking at are those who are practicing on a higher level. You know, and then realize that really we are not doing what we should be doing. There are many errors in our, our practice and our faith. So by looking in that way, we look to see how we can increase the faith. Be aware of the fact that it increases, that we don't become complacent and then in complacency we fall into sin. This is the way that shaitan comes and gets at us. He can't get you to worship other than Allah because that's too obvious. So it gets you to fall into sin. You know, through feeling that you've believed, you are saved. So then you're opened up now to fall into sin. And we should be conscious really of our deeds, what we have done, and take ourselves into account as Umar ibn al-Khattab used to say, take account of yourselves before your account is taken. Hasibu anfusakum qabla an tuhasabu. Take account of yourselves before your account is taken. So, we have in these verses that we've looked at, from uh, <clears throat> verse 11, 12, and 13, Allah describing His protection of the youths because of them turning to Him after they called on Him in prayer, which was mentioned in verse 10. Then Allah protected them by keeping them in that state of sleep for over 300 years. And he woke them up again, we said, as a test for themselves, but especially for the people of their time, as a demonstration of resurrection. That if Allah could do that, then surely he could bring the dead back to life. 